the 10th of April 1945. In an early evening sky over Leipzig, an armada of 230 Royal Air Force bombers are making their way to strike marshalling yards and factories. It is still daylight, the RAF having switched from nighttime raids as air superiority has been virtually achieved. Yet, there are pockets of resistance still determined to stave off the inevitable. And on this day is yet such an encounter. Only this time, an almost forgotten event is about to transpire. Leutnant Friedrich Fritz Kell of Jagdgeschwade 400 has taken off from the nearby Brandis airfield. The aircraft is the highly volatile Messerschmitt 163 Comet, feared by both the Allies and the Luftwaffe crews alike. However, this is no ordinary comet. Nestled in its wings, an experimental weapon is now being operationally deployed for the first time. For Kelp, this mission will entail tactics that are slightly different from the usual with the tiny rocket-powered aircraft. Ordinarily, with the few-minute fuel supply, there is only enough time for one, perhaps two, jousts into the concentration of bombers firing the powerful 30mm MK-108 cannons. On this occasion, there are no cannons fitted, as an even more powerful weapon is nestled within the wings of the aircraft. Aiming for the bombers, Caleb passes underneath, which triggers the weapon automatically. A far more powerful punch is delivered, and it seems the hapless Lancaster has been destroyed. This is the first operational use of the Sondergerät 500 Jägerfaust, or Hunter's Fist, and this nightmarish weapon seemingly might offer an answer to the overwhelming Allied onslaught. So what exactly was this weapon? How was it used? And why has it been almost lost in the annals of history? To answer all of this, it is necessary to look at the development and operational usage of the comet itself, and why such an unconventional weapon would be used with such an unconventional aircraft. The comet came into operational use at a time when it was increasingly clear that defeat was certain. After a considerable development process, initially with a glider concept, two refinements to the design of the aircraft itself, the new comets were assigned to Jagdgeschwader 400, comets having been experimented previously with the test unit Empermundskommando ZXZ, or Test Command 16. Given the complexities of the aircraft, the extreme speeds and the inherent dangers of the fuel and landing method, highly skilled and experienced pilots were selected. These were under the command of the veteran Major Wolfgang Spett, and new tactics had to be devised to make the best use of such an unorthodox aircraft. Indeed, devising these methods were fraught with inherent dangers not found with conventional aircraft. Being the first and thus far only production Raketenjäger, or rocket fighter, the Comet would utilize an incredibly corrosive and highly explosive fuel source. Seastoff, primarily methanol and hydrazine, would be used as the propellant, with T-stoff, primarily hydrogen peroxide, would be used as an oxidizer. This combination, which resulted in a number of horrific accidents, pushed the tiny Comet to blistering speeds, with the ability to reach an unparalleled 40,000 feet in three minutes from the rocket motor ignition. However, the blistering speed as well as fuel consumption and capacity limitations meant that the comet could only be realistically deployed as an interceptor. Accordingly, the weapon rig installed and tactics which would need to be adopted had to factor these limitations. Under Spetz's watchful eye, the experienced pilots of Jagdgeschwader 400 would develop what would become the familiar jousts of the comet upon the masses of bomber formations, which seemed relentless in their almost daily attacks. At first, the comets were armed with a potent Waffenfabrik Mauser MG-151 20mm cannon in the wing roots, with 80 rounds per gun. However, this was deemed unsatisfactory and the even more powerful Rheinmetall Borsig MK-108 30mm cannons would be installed, and this would be the standard armament of the Comet. As before, 
These would be installed in the wing roots. Although a larger caliber, the MK108 had a more compact design and could deliver a more powerful punch in a weapon package in approximately half the size of the MG151. These weapons, however, were dependent on the skill of the pilot being able to not only manage the challenges of the aircraft, but the extreme difficulty in successfully hitting a target in the often single opportunity of attack. With that expended, the pilot would be extremely vulnerable, as with fuel used up, he would attempt to glide back to base, with the danger not only from the bombers themselves, but escorting fighters pouncing upon that precise moment of vulnerability. Thus a new development was born, in which it was hoped that a solution could be found to overcome these challenges and bring down as many bombers as possible. Applying experience already gained in scenarios like Ville de Sao, or wild boar operations against RAF night bombing formations, it was in these operations that the lethal Schreg Musik configuration was first deployed. Exploiting the weak points of the enemy bombers, night fighters using these slanted upward firing guns could tear into their targets with impunity. Expanding further upon this concept was the intention to use more powerful weaponry. The SG-116 Zellendusch, or Cell Shower, was an attempt at placing upward firing single-shot recoilless rifles within a Focke-Wulf FW-190. Though these were not successful, they did provide the starting point for a heavier weapons platform on the Comet. Attention was turned to Dr. Heinrich Langweiler, a ballistic specialist at Hugo Schneider Adrien Gesellschaft Mittelwarenfabrik, or HASAG. Already famed for his development of the Faustpatron and Panzerfaust anti-tank weapons, Langweiler could be turned to for a simple solution to providing as powerful a punch as possible in a relatively compact and efficient design. The result would lead to what would become the SG-500. With a length of 52 centimeters, the weapon protruded from above and below the wing. Within was a rifled barrel. Upon triggering of the sensor, the shell was fired, releasing pins that held the barrel in place. Thus, the barrel would be ejected downwards, with the shell firing upwards. Given the desperate shortage of materials at the time, the weapon was made as simply and cheaply as possible. Unlike the earlier Rheinmetall-designed SG-116, in the case of the SG-500, the calibre would be increased to 50mm. Testing began with the focke 190, fitted with the SG-500 tubes, and tasked with flying underneath the target, a sheet of canvas around 40 meters wide, suspended from two poles, 25 meters high from the ground. Although the rebounding barrels off the ground nearly struck the aircraft, the test was successful. At this point, though, the overall situation for Germany was dire. Kelb elected to test the weapon in combat himself, and would finally get the opportunity on the 10th of April, 1945. That day, the bomber armada consisted mainly of Royal Canadian Air Force squadrons, 134 Avro Lancasters from 405, 419, 424, 427, 428, 429, 431, 433, and 434 squadrons. 90 Handley Page Halifaxes from 408, 415, 420, 425, 426, and 432 squadrons. With six de Havilland Mosquitoes from 105 squadron. Some of those squadrons were pathfinders, particularly the Lancasters of 405 squadron, as well as the Mosquitoes of 105 squadron and were attached to number 8 Pathfinders Group. Employing the new strategies for the Jägerfaust, Kelb made his diving approach towards the formation of Lancasters. Unlike the jousts with cannon, this was made with the throttle set to higher speed, thereby limiting the range further and allowing only a single approach. But only a single approach would be needed, and as Kelb's comet passed underneath the formation, the nearest target would be K for King, serial ME315 of the Canadian 405 Squadron. 
From the ground, Feldwebel Hans Hoover, a signal officer assigned to the radar section of Jagdschwader 400, was observing the event through a flak telescope. According to his account, I thought he wanted to ram it, but just at the moment as he passed, about 100 meters below the aircraft, the bomber exploded in a cloud of smoke and flames. I had never before seen a bomber so easily destroyed as that attacked by Leutnant Kelb. And so it seemed that the Jägerfaust had claimed its first bomber. But it was not so. Unbeknownst to Kelb and those observing from below, ME315 had survived the ordeal, albeit the damage inflicted was catastrophic. The rear turret had been completely blown away in the explosion, as well as significant sections of the right rudder and elevator. Flight Lieutenant Air Gunner Melbourne Leslie Melstrom was killed in the attack, and he was buried at Engelsdorf, having been identified by British prisoners of war from the nearby Stalag 4. Amazingly, the pilot, squadron leader Campbell Halibutron Muscles, managed to wrestle and maintain control of the seriously damaged aircraft, as seen in the following report. In the target area, immediately following release of target indicators, aircraft was attacked by an enemy fighter identified as an ME-163. The attacking aircraft approached from the rear and above, and with one burst completely shot away the rear turret, rudder and elevator. Damage was also caused to the H-2S set and mid-upper turret. The rear gunner, Flight Lieutenant Melstrom, was in his turret when the attack commenced and is believed killed. This officer is missing, no further information available. A number of Mustangs who were acting as fighter escort moved in closer to the disabled aircraft and covered it until it reached the front lines. The pilot, due to the fact that he had only partial control of the aircraft, ordered the wireless operator, navigator, air bomber and visual air bomber, except for the mid-upper gunner, to bail out over RAF station Woodbridge. Had not the mid-upper gunner been injured, the whole crew would have bailed out. The pilot was successful in making a reasonable landing at RAF station Woodbridge. All members of this crew, with the exception of the rear gunner, are back at this unit. What is most remarkable about this story is that Muscles was able to bring the battered Lancaster home. Two aircraft were lost in the raid, one to Flak, and the other hit by a falling bomb from an aircraft higher up. This was the first and only operational use of the weapon, and the final operational use of the Comet. There would be no further usage of the Jägerfaust, as, ironically, the Hasag factory was destroyed in that massive raid on the 10th of April. What became of Fritz Kelb? With the apparent end of the comet and the Reif's defences effectively crumbling, Kelb would transfer to Jagdschwader 7, flying the jet Metschmidt ME262. In the late afternoon of the 30th of April 1945, four Soviet Jagdlevyak 9s of the 107th Guards Fighter Aviation Regiment would encounter ME262 opposition and in the ensuing combat, one of the jets would be shot down. The pilot, presumed to be Kelb, managed to escape the cockpit of the doomed aircraft. However, his parachute did not deploy. So what is the lasting legacy of the SG-500? Having arrived so late in the war, and being implemented in an aircraft with severe limitations, it is difficult to see how much more of a difference this weapon could have made. Perhaps deployed in larger numbers, the terrifying and destructive capability may have impeded the bombing raids somewhat. But in early 1945, there is no doubt that it would only be a matter of time before the inevitable capitulation. Nevertheless, there is no denying the novel approach, the skill of the Comet pilots, and unique attributes of the Jägerfaust would enhance an already extraordinary aircraft.